Adhikarana 11. Past accumulated results are destroyed. Under the previous topic, it was ascertained that virtue and vice are destroyed by knowledge. Now it is being discussed whether that destruction occurs indiscriminately with regard to all the virtues and vices that have begun or have not begun to yield their fruits, or they occur specifically with regard to those virtues and vices that have not begun to yield fruits. Now, since in the Upanishadic texts like He Conquers Both of Them, Brihadaranyaka 4.4.22, no specification is met with, the destruction may occur indiscriminately to all. That being the possibility, the aphorist refutes by saying, Sutra 15, Anarabdhakarye eva tu purve tadavade tu, but purve, the past tu, Anarabdhakarye which have not begun to produce results, eva alone are destroyed. Tat avade, for that death is set as the limit of waiting for that liberation. Translation. But only those past virtues and vices get destroyed, which have not begun to bear fruit, for death is set as the limit of waiting for liberation. After the acquisition of knowledge, those virtues and vices that have not begun to yield their fruits and that were accumulated in earlier lives or even in this life before the dawn of knowledge are alone destroyed. But not so are those destroyed whose results have already been partially enjoyed and by which has been begun this present life in which the knowledge of Brahman arises. How is this known? Because the text, he lingers so long only as he is not freed from the body, then he becomes free. Chandogya 6.14.2 shows that liberation is put off till the death of the body. Were it not so, the text would not have spoken of any waiting till the death of the body. For one would then attain liberation immediately after the acquisition of knowledge, inasmuch as there would be no reason for his continuing in the body after all the works are annihilated by knowledge. Opponent. If this realization that the self is not an agent annihilates all results of work by its own intrinsic power, how can it demolish only some, leaving behind others? For when the same kind of contact is present between fire and some seeds, it cannot be held that some of the seeds will lose their power of germination while others will not. Vedantin. The answer is, it cannot be that knowledge can arise without the help of some residual results of actions that have begun to bear fruit. And when it is granted that knowledge is based on that medium, that is to say, the body produced by the residual results. It is but natural that knowledge has to wait for its result till the acquired momentum of that medium exhausts itself out, as in the case of a wheel of a potter, for there is nothing to stop it in the intervening period. As for the knowledge of the self, as the non-performer of any act, that destroys the results of works by first sublating false ignorance. This false ignorance, even when sublated, continues for a while owing to past tendencies, like the continuance of the vision of two moons. Furthermore, no difference of opinion is possible here as to whether the body is retained after knowledge for some time or not by the knowers of Brahman. For when somebody feels in his heart that he has realized Brahman and yet holds the body, how can this be denied by somebody else? This very fact is elaborated in the Upanishads and the Smritis in the course of determining the characteristics of the man of steady wisdom, Stita Pragna, Gita 254. Hence the conclusion is that only those virtues and vices are washed away by knowledge which have not begun to bear fruit. Namaste. Well, this really nails the discussion. 
and makes it a clear conclusion that the karma, which is not due to manifest in this life, is completely destroyed at the time of realization. So the only karma that's left is the prarabdha karma, which applies to the present body. Now, why do we need to keep the prarabdha karma, even though enlightened? Well, there are two issues, before and after enlightenment. Before enlightenment, one requires a platform, a, a space, huh, which is aligned with the purposes of enlightenment and which provides the background or the location for enlightenment to take place. And this is determined by the previous karma, huh? karma from previous lives. Therefore, we can understand that if someone displays symptoms of enlightenment, such as knowledge and detachment and freedom from suffering and so on, they must have performed sadhana extensively, meditation deeply in their previous lives. Because only in that way can the karma at birth in this body be configured such that it's possible to attain enlightenment. Now, from study of astrology, we know, uh, especially from Parashara, that enlightenment or moksha is shown in the birth chart. It's called moksha karaka. And there are four or five of them detailed in the Parashara's Aura Shastra, which is the primary and the earliest text on Vedic astrology, Jyotish. Now, by the way, there's a clue in the name of the work, Aura Shastra, Hora, H-O-R-A, hours, huh? that astrology, contrary to most people's misconceptions, astrology does not cause anything. It's a clock. It's just like, you know, uh, oh, when it's 5 o'clock, it's time to get up in the morning. Or when it's, you know, 12 o'clock, it's time to eat lunch, right? The clock does not cause your eating lunch. But it reminds you that it's time to do this thing, isn't it? So in the same way, the positions of the planets and stars in the sky show us the nature of the time, the quality of the time. And given that quality of time, certain events are more likely to happen or less likely to happen. It's like it's indicating the odds on the cosmic roulette wheel <laughs> or whatever, dice game or whatever it is. You know, the dice game in Mahabharata uh, is a symbol of so many things. But mostly it's a symbol that we don't really know our past karma. So we have no idea really what's going to happen in this life. Without some kind of direction, without some kind of a reading to indicate the present status of our karma. Are we close to enlightenment? Do we have any outstanding issues? Are there going to be obstacles? Um, you know, how is the best way to proceed? Where should we take up our progress on the path from karma yoga, bhakti yoga, you know, raja yoga, jnana yoga. What, what are we qualified for? What are our uh, past qualifications that led us to this particular life? All of this is known through astrology. So it's very helpful for the student of self-realization to also study astrology. Now, that said, once the qualified person performs what little sadhana is left and reaches enlightenment, even just first path enlightenment, the glimpse that Brahman is in the world and the world is in Brahman, huh? even that realization of Saguna Brahman, 
is enough to guarantee liberation. If not in this life, then, you know, very soon, the Buddha says, within seven lifetimes. But I think it can happen even quicker if we continue sadhana after this big realization. This is crucial. First path is only first path. Huh? The final liberation is fourth path. And they each have different symptoms and stuff like that. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It describes everything. So the path realizations are only the indicators that there has been a substantial change in consciousness, a tangible shift in point of view from duality to non-duality. And this is what we want to see. This is, this is what we want to know that indicates the person is ready for enlightenment. If not in this life, then very soon thereafter. But when that enlightenment is reached, all the future karma is also wiped out. See, the sanchari karma is the karma left over from previous lives that is not going to manifest in this life. And kriyamana karma is the karma both from last lifetimes and this lifetime that is going to manifest in future lifetimes. So enlightenment destroys both of these, the sanchari and the kriyamana karma. That's why it's said someone who realizes this Brahman, the ground of all being, the essence of consciousness and so on, is not subject to any sinful reaction, even the killing of a Brahmana in this life. I mean, that doesn't mean that we should go around killing people. <laughs> it just means if something happens that requires us, let's say, to defend ourselves, and employ violence or hurt others or even kill, uh, like Arjuna. In Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is faced with a terrible choice, dilemma, that if he kills his rascal relatives, you know, he, he himself will feel uh, covered by sinful reaction. But if he doesn't kill them, that's wrong too, because their actions are against dharma, and so they should not be ruling the kingdom. So he's faced with this dilemma, and Krishna resolves it by saying, it's okay, since you're working for me, uh, Krishna is an enlightened being. Krishna is a Bhagavan. He has realized himself. So if you're acting under my direction, it's okay, you can kill any number of people. And he killed, I don't know, hundreds of thousands or millions in that battle. And the Pandavas combined killed hundreds of millions of troops of the Kauravas, and the Kauravas killed their troops. Huh? I think 400, 500 millions or something like that. To the point that after the battle, the only qualified ruling family left was the Pandavas. So, even so, the Pandavas were roiled with grief upon the killing of their kinsmen. And so they performed all kinds of sacrifices and made all kinds of offerings to the sages and to the uh, relatives like Bhishma, and Krishna, and Drupad, and so many others, senior relatives, to stave off the sinful reactions, even though Krishna assured them there were no sinful reactions. See, this is known as being scrupulous, being excellent, being perfect, that if you make a mess, you clean it up, basically. If you perform some action, even on an enlightened platform that necessitates or would ordinarily demand a karmic reaction, you do the expiation. You do the rituals and the other things that nullify that sinful karma in this life. Uh, in other words, 
we're not going to bank on, we're not going to bet on that our enlightenment, whatever stage we reach, is going to wipe out our sinful reactions in the future. We take care of it. We take it into our own hands. We don't expect anybody to do the work for us. But we perform the rituals. We do the sadhana. We study as, as necessary the means to attain these higher states of consciousness. And we do the work to reach them. See, this is ethical life. This is enlightened life. This is the real life. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.